In August of last year, the International Astronomical Union announced a new contest, Name Exo Worlds 3, in an attempt to get the public involved in the naming of 20 exoplanets. As it currently stands, most exoplanet names are just random assortments of letters and numbers, but thanks to contests like these, this will start to change. You might remember I submitted an entry of my own where I tried to figure out which of the 20 planets I wanted to name by using what we know about them to determine the one most capable of hosting life, which eventually led me to Gliese 486b, or as we might very well soon be calling it, Eurypterus. Though as of recording this, the final votes are still being tallied and won't be released until March 20th, so whether or not the name I entered ends up being the moniker of this alien world is still very much up in the air. However, in my pursuit of the most habitable planet on this list, I ended up eliminating 16 of the 20 candidates right off the bat, simply because they were greater than 5 Earth masses, meaning they'd all likely be gas planets, which aren't really optimal places for finding life. And at first, I had trouble understanding why the IAU decided to focus on so many seemingly lifeless places instead of giving names to more promising prospects like Kepler-186f, Proxima Centauri b, or the entire TRAPPIST-1 system. But I'll also admit that I know next to nothing about any of these places, besides the fact that they're giant balls of gas. And so, in anticipation of the results of this contest coming out next month, let's learn more about the rest of these planets and try to figure out what makes them all so worthy of being named. Okay, I just need to say up front, this video is going to be very out of date very soon. Not only will all these planets be receiving new and proper names in a matter of weeks, but the reason they're receiving names is because these are the first 20 exoplanets the James Webb Space Telescope is preparing to look at and analyze. Like this, we can see how it's not actually the IAU that's dictating what planets are on this list, but rather each of these has been handpicked by NASA, and means that over the upcoming months we'll come to know way more about these planets places than I know currently, so even my best attempts at depicting or even describing them will inevitably become outdated. Knowing this, I don't really want to say too much about these places beyond what we can infer based on their masses and other known qualities. This turned out to be a really good idea actually, as it was only after ordering these planets by their mass that I came to notice a clear and deliberate pattern. Here, check this out. This is the first and smallest planet in our roster, Gliese 367b, which is only about half the mass of Earth, placing it almost perfectly between us and Mars in terms of size. Without any comparable objects in our solar system, we know shockingly little about these kinds of places. While we can't assume it'll be rocky, questions like how long did they remain geologically active, will they be able to support a system of plate tectonics, and how strong can their atmospheres be are all unanswered for the time being. And so we can already see how the choice to look at 367b was made with the goal of filling a specific gap in our understanding of terrestrial worlds. The same can be said for the next smallest planet on this list, Gliese 486b, our beloved Eurypterus. At 2.8 Earth masses, this represents an object essentially one size up from the Earth, what we'd call a super-Earth, another intriguing weight class that we know next to nothing about simply because we don't have an analog for one in our solar system, and so the only way to understand these kinds of planets in any meaningful way is by observing examples of them from neighboring systems. This mass in particular is significant because it's thought to ensure the planet will remain geologically active, guaranteeing an observable atmosphere. 
Well, at least at its current orbital distance, it should have an atmosphere, unlike LHS 3844b, which despite being roughly the same size as Eurypterus, holds a much closer orbit, which has likely left its surface completely barren, blasted clean by its star's radiation, revealing the differences that can exist even between planets of the same size, and just how much more opportune Eurypterus appears by comparison. It's for these reasons that this is the planet I chose to try to name, as I think it has the best chances of being notable in one way or another. Though I must admit, even the conditions here look bleak. The reason for this is simple. Gliese 486b orbits exceedingly close to its star, which combined with even a moderate atmosphere will still likely produce an excessively hot world, with a boiling surface and choking air. I was again a little frustrated by the fact that we were using our first glimpses of a super-Earth to look at such an obviously irradiated world instead of, you know, something more promising, but I had to remind myself that there must be a reason behind this as well. What I wasn't taking into account is just how incredibly hard it is to see exoplanets, as they don't naturally give off any light of their own, meaning our ability to observe them depends almost entirely on how much starlight they reflect. Of course, the closer a planet is to its parent star, the brighter it'll appear to be, and so in order to maximize our ability to observe these distant worlds, we've purposefully chosen a planet in close proximity to its light source. And then, the only way we'd be able to detect something as faint as an atmosphere is if the planet has really strong, obvious signals of having one. Put this together and the reason we're looking at a planet like Gliese 486b isn't because we're hoping to find life here, but rather because we need an easy target whose position will make it easier for us to see and surface conditions will make it easier for us to study. In fact, pretty much every planet we look at today will follow in this trend, all having extremely tight orbits with their parent stars. Not because that's what we're most curious about, but simply because that's what makes us capable of observing them in the first place. The fourth and final terrestrial world on this list, L168-9b, is nearly five Earth masses, another size up. This has made it one of the most observably accessible terrestrial planets for future atmospheric characterization. Or in plain English, a planet this big is sure to have an atmosphere thick enough for our instruments to detect, even if that means it'll likely be turned into a Venusian wasteland as a result. But overall, I hope you can see that by looking at these together, we can start to build an understanding of the wide variety terrestrial worlds exist across. However, at 14 Earth masses, Uranus is the next biggest planet in the solar system, and clearly by this size, planets undergo a dramatic transformation, where their surfaces become obscured beneath truly deep atmospheres and clouds of ice. Though exactly where and how this transition takes place between Earth and Uranus remains unknown and something a look at Gliese 1214b will hopefully shed some light on. At just over 8 Earth masses, 1214b sits almost perfectly between these two in terms of size and hopefully means we'll capture a planet in an intermediate state between terrestrial and icy. To this day, no one can actually agree on what a planet this size will be like. Some expect to find a super-Earth beneath a massive atmosphere. Others posit it'd already be frozen over into an ice world akin to Neptune. And yet everyone's favorite idea seems to be that it might harbor a deep ocean. If you ask me, choice B, a mini-Neptune seems most likely, but no matter what, all these ideas being thrown around should be a clear indication that this remains another gap in our knowledge for the time being, and explains why we're spending valuable time and resources to take a look at it. The next biggest planet is Gliese 3470b, which is approximately 14 Earth masses, or about equivalent to Uranus. Now, I'll be honest, this is the only planet on this whole list that's a comparable size to one within our own solar system, so I'm not exactly sure why we're looking at it. 
On the one hand, it can be assumed that since we already know a fair amount about Uranus, we'll also be quite familiar with the conditions found on Gliese 3470b. But on the other hand, that's just an assumption, and it'll only be by taking a closer look at it that we'll be able to put these assumptions to the test, and learn both what similarities and differences might exist between planets of the same size. After Uranus, Neptune weighs a similar 17 Earth masses, and as a result we can see the two ice planets resemble one another greatly. This gives us very little reason to investigate what a planet between these masses may be like, as chances are it'd look basically the same as these, explaining why the next three planets being looked at are each incrementally larger than Neptune, starting with Hat-P-26b at 19 Earth masses, then Gliese 436 b at 23 Earth masses, and LTT-9779b coming in at 29 Earth masses. Together, these should give us a better idea of how ice giants change as they grow larger, each step along the way becoming more and more shrouded by gases, until a new kind of transition begins taking place. The next biggest planet in our solar system is Saturn, which at 95 Earth masses represents a significant increase from Neptune. This difference in size is in turn what has caused such a stark difference in appearance between the two, cluing us into the fact that as planets get even bigger, their atmospheres continue to build and build until even the ice storms plunge beneath the hydrogen haze, and the object attains its final form, a gas planet. Of course, exactly how this transition takes place and what it looks like again remain unknown, as the only examples we currently have fall clearly on either side of it. But by looking at WASP-166b, HATS-72b, HAT-P-12b, and WASP-69b, we'll hopefully get to see planets at different stages in this process. As they grow, their storms will only become more powerful, eventually separating into Coriolis bands, signifying the transition from ice giant to gas giant. After Saturn, the next and final reliable data point we have is Jupiter, which comes in at over 300 Earth masses, leaving another apparent gap in our understanding. However, only a single planet is being looked at within this range, WASP-63b, with a mass of 120 Earths. At first, I couldn't really figure out why we'd be ignoring planets that fall within this range, but then I realized Saturn and Jupiter are again already pretty similar, showing us that not much really changes about a planet between 100 to 300 Earth masses. If this logic proves true, we'll find confirmation of it when looking at WASP-63b, where in all likelihood we'll find a fairly average gas giant. However, while Jupiter may be the largest planet in our solar system, observations tell us even larger planets exist elsewhere, ones that we have little to no real frame of reference for, meaning we've arrived at our final frontier, and it'll only be by looking at super Jovian worlds like WASP-19b and WASP-121b that we'll start to establish a baseline understanding of these kinds of places. Both weighing in at around 368 Earths, the expectation here is that these will represent only marginally larger Jupiter analogs for us to compare against one another, hopefully giving us an idea of the differences that might exist between planets of this scale. After this, WASP-43b will inform us on what a planet nearly twice the mass of Jupiter is like. Then HD-95086b will be nearly 5 Jupiters. WD-0806-661b comes in at 7.5 Jupiters. And finally, HIP-65426b is the biggest planet receiving a name this time around, at over 10 Jupiters, or 3,000 Earth masses. As they get bigger, their storms will only become more energetic and more complex, adding more rings and more vortexes until eventually the planet begins transitioning into an entirely different class of object, a star. 
This of course is another whole complicated process, but thankfully it's at this point that these objects start emitting light of their own, which makes them just so much easier to see and study than planets, meaning this is really where our lack of knowledge ends, and thus planets like HIP 65426b represent the largest objects yet to be extensively studied. That might be why we actually already looked at it with the James Webb Space Telescope. And in fact, if you'll remember, this was the very first exoplanet it imaged all the way back in August of 2022. And I guess that makes sense, right? If you're trying out a telescope's ability to detect exoplanets for the first time ever, you might as well aim it at the biggest and brightest one just to make sure everything's working properly. Altogether, what I hope you can see is how the first exoplanets being targeted by the James Webb Space Telescope, and by extension those receiving names through this contest, aren't actually as random as they seem, but rather were all very intentionally selected to provide us with a more complete understanding of planetary mechanics, which we'll then be able to apply to all future study of exoplanets. So, while these might not have been my first picks for what we look at, I can at the very least appreciate the method behind these choices, and rest assured knowing no opportunity to use this incredible tool is being wasted. Another incredible tool we all have at our disposal is our brains, which is why I was so excited to work with the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.org. Here, you can learn the very same skills astronomers use to find planets beyond our own, like astrophysics, through a series of fun and interactive lessons. Because many of us can't go into space ourselves, the only way to learn about such abstract concepts like supernovas, black holes, or exoplanets would be to read textbooks or attend lectures, which either cost a lot of money or a lot of time. But Brilliant offers a way to learn about these distant objects through a hands-on experience. Nowhere else are you given both the knowledge and the tools to conceptualize the vastness of space. Of course, if you feel like you've already learned enough astrophysics from me, Brilliant has thousands of other lessons as well, covering a wide range of STEM topics, with everything from classical mechanics to gravitational physics all the way to quantum objects. So if you want to learn more about space, and you want to do so in a way that your brain will actually enjoy and remember, then make sure to head on over to brilliant.org slash astropro, where not only will you get to try it out for a full 30 days completely free, but the first 200 people to sign up using this link will take an extra 20% off a yearly premium subscription. To have a partner like Brilliant sponsoring the channel means I can invest more time into it, and so even by just trying out Brilliant for free, not only will you learn a skill or two, but you'll also be supporting this channel and the future potential of Astro Pro. So once again, please make sure to visit the URL on screen or in the description for a free month long trial plus 20% off a yearly subscription. And thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video.